hello everyone and welcome to my talk. Yeah, um, today I'm going to talk about closures and uh, how to avoid common safety hazards when using them in, in concurrent and distributed programs. Um, and uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Philip Haller and um, I'll just give, give a few words uh, on my background. So uh, I'm a faculty member at um, KTH, uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, before joining KTH, I was uh, a member of the Scala team and uh, for about nine years. And for about three of these years, I worked at uh, TypeSafe, which is now uh, Lightband. And I've essentially worked on uh, uh, many things. Uh, one of one of the things is um, concurrent and distributed programming. So I created, uh, for instance, uh, Scala Actors, which uh, was one of the first uh, widely used uh, actor frameworks. Uh, it was actually used uh, in production at Twitter and some other companies. Um, that was sort of before before the ACA effort, which I also contributed to. Um, I created, uh, I was one of the creators of the of futures in, in the Scala core library and uh, also of Scala async. And uh, sort of on the research track, I've done quite some work on type systems as well. So on capabilities, uh, affine types and uh, uh, things called consistency types and, and other things. But uh, today I want to talk about closures and um, uh, the many ways in which code can have safety issues uh, that uses closures. And, um, and I want to talk about how to write safer code. And, uh, and then I want to introduce a, a new library for Scala 3 that makes using closures both more, more uh, flexible and also safer. Okay. And, and then I also want to talk a little bit about the implementation uh, of Spores 3, some of the interesting parts. And uh, yeah, so let's uh, get started. Um, first, uh, what's a closure? Um, I'm sure uh, virtually all of you probably have used closures uh, if you used Scala. Um, but I want to take this opportunity to actually remind us of the original definition of what a closure is, OK? so. In this simple example, right, we have a list of integers and uh, a threshold constant. And then we're essentially using this filter um, combinator to filter out all the numbers that are less than the given threshold, OK? And uh, that should result in this expected uh, list, right? And um, now in blue, right, we see this um, anonymous function, right, or function literal. And um, that one, you know, has one parameter, and it refers to this threshold uh, threshold variable, right? Which has been defined in this enclosing scope, and that's also called the lexical context, right? And um, now, uh, how is it possible, right, to use a variable that's defined outside of this anonymous function? Well, this is where uh, a closure comes in, right? And According to the original definition, right, a closure is an anonymous function whose open bindings have been closed by the lexical environment. Okay, so what's an open binding? Well, that's something we would usually call free variable uh, nowadays. Uh, so there were times when these were also called open bindings. Okay, so threshold is such an open binding or a free variable. Right, because it's not defined within the anonymous function, but um, somewhere outside. And um, a closure now closes that one, you know, by essentially copying uh, what's in the lexical environment into the uh, environment of the closure, so that when we execute the closure, we can actually access that threshold uh, um, uh, value. Okay, and so this uh, definition actually is attributed uh, to the late Peter Landin. Um, right, so closures um, are essentially used uh, virtually everywhere, right, if you write Scala code. 
Um, for instance, if we use uh, a data processing engine like Apache Spark, right? Um, then um, even for very simple programs, uh, as shown here, we tend to use uh, many closures, right? So this is one of the simplest uh, examples that we can think of, where basically we're reading a text file and we use Spark to, to determine, you know, what's the maximal number of words on any line of text in, in this file. Right, and we use essentially map and reduce to, you know, um, first split each line into uh, into words, and then the number of words, and then essentially we use reduce to compute the maximum of the uh, numbers of of words on on all these lines, right? And you can see that already in this very simple uh, example, we use uh, two closures already, right? Um, another context where we tend to use closures is uh, concurrent programming, right? So let's say we want to, um, we have a computation that may take some time. And so we want to concurrently uh, execute the computation uh, uh, and uh, in this case using futures, right? So here we're given a list of customers, okay? Um, and we want to compute the average age uh, of these customers. And uh, we want to do this concurrently so that the main uh, program, let's say, can sort of is not blocked uh, due to this computation. And so we simply, you know, uh, spawn a future. And uh, to do this, you know, we create this blue closure. Okay. In this case, it's a, uh, a thunk, meaning you know, a closure that doesn't have a parameter, right? Um, it's just a, a block of code that we would like to execute uh, concurrently, okay? So we basically, you know, create this blue closure and uh, uh, it, it, you know, refers to this customer's list, of course, and, you know, goes through it and uh, using flat map, et cetera, it computes essentially uh, yeah, the average age of customers in this in this list. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. So closures obviously are used a lot in Scala code, uh, but unfortunately, there are quite a few ways in which code can go wrong. Essentially, um, uh, when using closures in various settings, and um, again, if we take uh, a simple example using uh, Spark again, right? Then, uh, right, in this example, we we have this array of numbers and we turn this into a uh, so-called uh, distributed data set. So you don't need to know much about Spark to understand the example, okay, I promise, okay? Uh, we're basically just turning this array into a, a, a Spark uh, data set. And uh, then we have sort of this super simple method uh, transform, right? Uh, which you know we can think of you know transforming each uh, element of the data set in some way. In this case, it's a very simple uh, one. And and then you know in this test method, basically we again use map to uh, you know uh, uh, transform the data set into a new data set where each element is replaced with the, the transformation uh, using this transform method, right? Uh, very simple. And then on the second line here, we basically collect uh, all the, the data in this transform data set. Uh, we collect it on the, in this case, the driver node, which is sort of the main node, and uh, uh, we print each element of the data set, okay? Now, this looks very simple. Unfortunately, when we run this program, uh, we get a an exception, uh, a Spark exception, uh, which says task not serializable. Well, what what is that, and and why, right? What did we do wrong, right? I mean, there's this program is so simple, it's hard to see uh, what can go wrong. And um, but the the thing is, we we essentially need to look at. Um, the first closure here, which takes an element and uh, transforms it, right? Calls transform. And um, 
to understand why this might be an issue, we need to know some basics of the distributed execution. Because essentially what happens is that um, the, a data set is in general distributed across uh, several executors or worker nodes uh, so that each executor essentially uh, maintains uh, one part of the data set, right? So you can actually process data sets that don't fit in the memory of a single machine. That's uh, one of the main goals of Spark to allow to allow you to do that. Um, but that means that um, since we want to apply this closure to all uh, elements of the data set, we need to send this closure to, to, to each worker so that the worker can apply the closure to its part of the data set, OK? Um, now, in order to send a closure across the network, of course, we need to first uh, serialize it. And um, how can we serialize this closure? Well, um, we need to, of course, serialize um, this instance of the you know, uh, closure object uh, underneath. And since the closure might have an environment, we have to also serialize uh, the environment. And in this case, transform, uh, the, the, the invocation of transform is, of course, a shorthand for this dot transform, right? Because we're calling a method uh, on this. Um, but uh, that means that the closure actually captures uh, this, right? It captures the this reference. And that means when we serialize the closure, we need to serialize not only the instance of the you know, anonymous function uh, object, but also the captured uh, variable. So we have to serialize uh, this, OK? Um, but what is the type of this, right? Well, the type is Spark example. Can we serialize that? Uh, no, we, we can't, right? It's not prepared for serialization, um, this class, right? And that's why you know we cannot serialize the closure, and that means that um, the underlying task that's created by Spark uh, cannot be serialized, and we get a runtime exception. Okay, so that's um, that tells us that essentially using closures can, of course, be a safety risk, right, in a distributed setting, um, because you know depending on the framework that we use. Um, the closures might have to be serialized, and that can result in runtime errors, uh, right? Like not serializable exceptions uh, on the JVM. Now, what about concurrency, right? Uh, well, if you if you revisit the example I showed you earlier, where we you know asynchronously compute the average age uh, of a list of customers, um, we actually again, have a closure that refers to uh, variables in its lexical scope, in its lexical environment. So the first customers, right, which is a parameter of uh, average age. Um, but turns out we also refer to uh, a variable called customer data, right, customer data. And that, in this case, is here is a field. Um, and uh, well, of course, we can access it the only issue is that it's a mutable map. So that means that while this future, the task for that future is running, we might actually have concurrent, concurrent accesses to this to the same map, OK, uh, by the caller of average age, uh, for instance. Right? So that means we have actually a potential uh, data race here, right? because we're accessing a shared mutable uh, map. Okay, so so that means that of course also in the concurrent setting, we uh, we face uh, safety risks. Okay, if we use closures, right? Because if we if we execute closures on concurrent threads, uh, that can can cause data races if you if if the closure refers to shared mutable objects. Uh, anything else? Well, um, closures are of course so so uh, you know, important to Scala code that there is a bunch of use cases that might come up, right? So for instance, you know, uh, people are building you know, web applications that might have a front end using Scala JS and a back end running on a JVM. 
and uh, it's uh, totally uh, plausible that you know there might be closures that are actually exchanged between the front end and the back end. Okay, I mean we've already seen in Spark that you know closures are sent uh, across different machines on the network, so it's not a stretch to think that you might want to send a closure from from a front end on JavaScript on a JavaScript engine to a back end running on on a JVM, right? But as soon as you want to do that, well, you actually need a portable serialization scheme, right? Uh, you can't rely on you know uh, sort of a default uh, platform specific uh, serialization scheme, right? So, but out of the box, that's actually not uh, possible, right? Such a portable serialization. So, you know, to summarize a bit the the observations here, um, basically. All these safety issues that I showed you, they actually stem from this completely unrestricted variable capture um, that we have, right? We're, we can capture anything uh, that's in scope, uh, regardless of its type and, and so on, right? We can even capture reassignable uh, variables, uh, by the way. Um, and of course, in the concurrent setting, you know, the issue that I showed was that we were capturing and accessing shared mutable objects which uh, is, uh, leads to race conditions in general. And in a distributed setting, you know, I showed you that if we capture references to non-serializable objects, that can then, again, lead to runtime errors. So what are um, potential remedies? Well, uh, one uh, thing we could try to do is to restrict the types of the captured variables, right? So in a distributed setting, we might want to permit only types uh, that are known to be serializable, right? And not allow capturing any uh, any uh, uh, variables of types that we don't know whether they're serializable, right? Um, the other thing we could try to do is to um, change or, or, you know, adjust the way we capture uh, variables, okay? So essentially providing more capturing modes so you could imagine that a closure that is used to run a concurrent future, um, <clears throat> you know, could still use mutable objects, but before uh, or upon creation of the closure, we could deeply clone such objects so that the, the um, closure, you know, accesses essentially a snapshot of, the, of those uh, objects. Okay, and then of course the closure would operate on its own uh, local snapshots and could no longer interfere with um, the original mutable objects, right? So depending on the application, this could actually be again a solution, right? So, okay, so how do we then in general write safer closure using code? Well, of course, in general, we need to of course check the captured variables, right? And of course, we should probably not capture too many variables uh, to begin with, right? Because we might actually miss something, you know, uh, on along the way, right? If you have a closure that captures uh, seven variables, that's probably hard to check for for any safety issues, right? Um, and of course, the types of the variables that we capture must be safe. So it's good to prefer immutable types, right? Um, especially because closures are created and applied at different points in time, uh, usually, right? So it's easier to reason about them uh, if you use immutable types. Um, and then we have to check the required properties, right? Do we need serializability or concurrency safety or uh, something else, right? But of course, these safety checks, um, like it would be nice if the compiler could help us uh, check those, right? So that we don't uh, miss uh, miss anything, okay. And um, of course, in general, the question uh, whenever we create a closure is is essentially, you know, what's the logical memory snapshot that the closure should be initialized with, right? But that's uh, that's kind of a semantic uh, question. Um, yeah, so it's not entirely trivial to write safe code, and um, this is why. Uh, in the following, I want to introduce a new library for Scala 3, 
uh, which is called Spores 3. And <clears throat> this library uh, tries to automate some of these safety checks and also uh, uh, tries to add some flexibility. Okay. Right. So, so um, like I mentioned, um, the first goal is to automate some of the safety checking to avoid issues uh, with concurrent and distributed code and um, to, to also expand a little bit the, the things that we can do with closures, okay, in a, in a let's say, fearless way. So a uh, particular uh, a portable serialization uh, a scheme, okay? Um, and how do we do this? Well, the main idea behind this, this, behind this library is called uh, spores, uh, hence the name uh, spores3, right? And uh, spores is actually not a new uh, idea. In fact, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, introduced this in a, in a research paper um, a few years ago uh, with my co-authors. And um, what a spore is, is basically a, a special kind of closure where the environment, meaning you know, the captured variables, they are made explicit, okay? They're sort of explicitly um, defined. And um, also, the type of the environment is uh, tracked uh, at compile time, so using uh, type refinements, OK? And this is nice because we can basically use that extra type information to express uh, some constraints, OK, that may be required uh, uh, for safety, right? Now, uh, since you know spores is not a new idea, the question is, of course, you know what's new in this uh, spores three uh, library? Well, I mean, first of all, it's uh, a completely new implementation uh, of this uh, idea of spores um, for Scala three, and it also tries to address some of the limitations of the original spores uh, implementation for, for Scala two. So, um, in particular. Um, uh, both libraries uh, use macros, but um, uh, in Spores 3, the usage is, is basically limited to compile time checks, OK? So um, uh, that makes things more robust and actually can also reduce compile times, uh, for instance. Um, Spores 3 is also portable from the beginning, right? So supporting, uh, for instance, Scala.js is not an afterthought, but it's, uh, you know, part of the design and implementation from, from the very beginning. Also, Spores 3 um, proposes a new approach to serialization. Um, and uh, it's based on type classes, which makes it, uh, you know, at the same time flexible um, because we can integrate this with multiple serialization frameworks. Um, but it also allows us to, to have a portable solution where uh, serializability is actually checked uh, statically, right? So it's also uh, a pretty safe uh, solution. Right. So let me give you an overview uh, of uh, Spores or Spores 3. So the simplest thing we can do, right, is, of course, create a Spore without an environment. And this is simply done by, you know, passing a function literal to, to the spore uh, factory. And um, in this case, the function literal is not permitted to capture anything. OK? And this is actually checked uh, at compile time using, using a macro. OK? Uh, so a very well behaved uh, spore. Now, this spore has the following type. Spore uh, with parameter type int and return type int. Right, and this um, type refinement, okay, where we have this type member env, which is equal to nothing. And what this means is that, you know, the type of the environment of the spore, meaning the type of what the spore captures uh, is nothing. And that makes sense because if we would try to access the, uh, the captured, uh, whatever is captured by the spore, there would not be any value we, we could return. So we would have to throw an exception, right? So the type nothing actually makes a perfect sense here, right? And um, now, 
in general, you know, spore types are actually subtypes of the corresponding function types. So uh, a spore type, a spore t comma r, right, extends the function type t arrow r, right? And it's also, you know, contravariant in the parameter type t and covariant in the return type r, just like function types. And um, well, mainly the, the main thing that it has in addition, right, is this type member env that I just showed you, okay, which is the type of the environment of the spore. And um, for safety reasons, this trait is also sealed so that, uh, yeah, uh, user code cannot uh, extend this trait. Okay, now spores with environments, right? So if we do want to capture something uh, in the environment, then we need to um, make this explicit, right? And so basically the spore needs to, in, to be explicitly initialized uh, with the environment. So for example, if this uh, variable str should be captured by the spore, then we you know, create the spore as before using the spore object, um, but we have to pass str as an argument, okay? So the, the, the environment is sort of uh, explicitly passed to the, to the factory. And, uh, and then in the body of the spore, we can access the environment using this extra parameter, uh, which I call env here, okay? So env, right, is the extra parameter that refers to the environment of the spore, right? And so in the body, we can basically, you know, uh, use both the, the parameter and the the environment okay um fine so you see that the environment is made uh quite explicit uh here and if you do if you sorry if you create a spore like that sorry about that um then <clears throat> a spore with environment right it has a different type so the spore s2 has now type uh spore from int to int where the, the type env is equal to string, okay? Because the spore captures um, a, uh, a variable of type string, okay? Good. Now, you may ask, well, why should we use an extra parameter for the environment? Doesn't that make the spore look a bit uh, clunky, right? Um, well, uh, yes, it's true that there is an extra parameter in our code, but it actually is convenient because we can use pattern matching to destructure the environment in case it consists of more than just one variable. So for instance, let's say we have two variables here, S and I, okay? And we want to capture both of them, right? Then uh, as before, we need to pass them explicitly to the uh, spore factory. And we do this using a tuple, right? Um, but then in the spore body, we can use pattern matching to immediately kind of decompose uh, the environment into the two parts, str and num, right? And then it's, you know, nice to use, to use those parts uh, in the body, okay? So um, this is actually also the reason why the environment is always the first parameter uh, in the spore body, right? So that we can easily pattern match uh, on it, okay? Good. Now, let's come to the second part, which is a bit more, uh, more important, perhaps, which are the type-based uh, constraints. Because now we have this type member env, right, which is always set to the type of the, of the environment, right? And this can actually be used to express some, yeah, safety constraints, for instance, right, using context parameters. So for example, let's say we want to require that a spore parameter only captures thread safe types. Yeah, right. So, so let's say we want to provide a method that creates a future and the future is supposed to run this given spore concurrently, right? So this spore S is essentially a thunk. So parameter type unit, return type T, and that should run concurrently, for example, on a thread pool or, or, or so, right? But now we can use the type member env of the spore s 
to express a constraint on the environment using this using clause, right? We can say, okay, there must be a type class instance of type class thread save for the type s.env, right? For the type of what the spore captures, yeah? And of course, you can imagine that thread save, you know, is a type class that where we have instances for, you know, all the types that we um, deem to be safe, like immutable types, uh, uh, primitives, of course, and like concurrent, concurrent data structures, right? Concurrent hash maps and so on. Okay. Um, and this now we would have a compile time guarantee that um, the environment of the spore is only referring to to thread safe types. Okay. Now uh, let's talk about serialization, right? Um, that was another goal to support that. Um, also based on type classes, right? Because that would make the design flexible because we could integrate with different frameworks. Um, and using type classes, we could also provide a portable scheme uh, and a safe scheme because serializability would be determined uh, at compile time, right? And sort of for our approach, we have some assumptions. So first of all, we assume that we use serialization primarily for communication between remote nodes, okay? Um, and also we assume that every node is running the same code. Now this assumption is actually shared by a number of frameworks, uh, including uh, Apache Spark and, and others, right? So this is not uh, such a strong uh, requirement, okay? This is quite common. And um, finally, we assume that there is no transmission of bytecode or, or source code. And that's, of course, an advantage for from a security point of view, right? So what's the approach? So again, since we don't want to send code, right? We're not serializing code. Um, instead, what we're serializing is uh, a unique identifier that allows us to instantiate the implementation uh, of the spore, right? Um, and the environment of the spore, which is of course needed to, to, to run that, right? And so in practice, what we do is we create spores using named spore builders, okay? And so these spore builders refer to the implementation and they have uh, a unique identifier, okay? Uh, so let me show you uh, an example. So we can define a spore builder uh, as follows. So here's a, an example a prepend uh, operation, right, which is defined using a spore builder. Uh, so it has, you know, parameter type, return type, and uh, it has the type of the environment as well, which is just an int uh, in this case, okay? So this prepend operation, of course, it, you know, it's very simple. It just prepends um, the environment to the parameter list, okay? Now, if you have a builder like that, we can create a serializable representation of the spore, uh, which is called spore data. Okay, and so the spore data uh, takes the builder and the environment uh, as arguments. Okay, um, and spore data now is something that we can serialize using, you know, uh, a framework that we want to use. For example, here I'm using MicroPickle. Right, um, uh, and um, you know, we're, uh, Spores three actually includes a uh, read writer for a micro pickle, so we can actually uh, simply you know pickle this spore data object. Okay, um, and what can come out here is, for instance, uh, JSON that looks like that, where we have uh, you know the fully qualified name of the builder and um, the environment. Okay, now how do we use this to enforce that our spores are definitely safe to serialize, right? Remember that this is one of the errors we want to avoid is you know getting runtime serialization uh, exceptions, right? And I'm gonna show you an example, which is a method send off, which takes uh, a spore, serializes it, and uh, sends it across uh, the network, right? And so how could this method look like? Well, 
basically, since we know that uh, spore data is a serializable, serializable representation of a spore, we can, this method can take spore data as a, as a parameter, right? And we use a type uh, parameter here, S, for um, convenience, okay? We will shortly see why, okay? So S has upper bound spore data, uh, here in this case from T to T, with an environment of type N. And N is a type parameter, so we abstract from the environment type, right? So this method can be used for spores with any type of environment, yeah? It's polymorphic in the type of the environment. And that's, of course, a very common thing to do, because typically we don't really want to know much about the environment, right? Uh, usually code should work uh, regardless of the specific environment, okay? So this is the type S, and, uh, and then we can now use a context parameter, um, like shown in blue, right? which basically requires that there is a read writer for type S. So read writer is uh, a type class for that uh, provides uh, serialization and deserialization for type S, right? So again, at compile time, we make sure that S can be serialized, okay? And S, the spore data can of course only be serialized if the environment can be serialized, right? So this is how we get the static check. Now, this context parameter, we can also uh, abbreviate actually using a, a context bound, right? So we can actually define S to, to have, you know, this upper bound and this so-called context bound after, after the colon, right? To make sure that, okay, type S is known to be uh, serializable, okay? Great. Now, we've seen how to serialize spores. How do we deserialize them, right? And, well, what we need to do in this case is to deserialize with a particular target type, uh, which is called packed spore data. And packed spore data basically abstracts from the, the environment. So, again, we don't need to know the type of the environment, right? That's uh, quite important. And when we have such a packed spore data, we can simply convert this uh, to a spore. And here we need to provide the parameter and return types, okay? But this is something that's usually known, right? Um, uh, definitely in a framework like Spark or, or similar ones, okay? There, these types will definitely be known. Okay, now, after this overview, I just wanna dive a little bit into the implementation uh, uh, to show you some interesting bits and pieces. So first, um, yeah, spore creation, right? So I, I told you that when we create a spore, there are certain compile time checks that are done. Uh, in particular, we check that the body of the spore does not capture any variable, right? So um, because the environment, you know, can only be passed explicitly as an argument, right? And so what's done here is uh, to use a macro to do this uh, capture checking at compile time, right? So essentially the apply method of object spore is an inline method, um, uh, right? So it's inlined at compile time and uh, we want to use um, code that that takes the, the arguments as expression trees so that they can be uh, checked, right? So basically the body of the spore, which again, it, it has one extra parameter for the environment. That's the first E parameter, right? Um, that body, we want to, you know, invest, uh, like uh, explore this as an expression tree. Uh, so we have to make this inline uh, so that we can pass it to this apply code method, right? And apply code basically takes these two expression trees and, um, does the co compile time check, okay? Um, and then apply code, you know, returns an expression tree that is then, you know, inserted um, into the inlined uh, invocation of apply, right? So this apply code is, you know, the, the actual macro that uh, takes, like I said, these two expression trees, one for the environment that we pass and one for the body expression 
which is the function literal. And um, this function literal is then essentially checked here, you know, for any capturing, any illegal capturing, right? Um, and if that's fine, you know, uh, we basically just uh, uh, return the, uh, the expression tree for that uh, newly created spore, you know, where the environment is set to E. Um, and so on. And you can also see that, okay, if you apply a spore, of course, what happens is that we use the body um, uh, function and we pass both the environment and the, the uh, uh, parameter of apply. Okay. Right. Um, good. Another interesting bit uh, from the implementation is actually how serialization is implemented. So if you recall, the creation of a spore builder, right? So we had this prepend example, which is a builder, a spore builder, right? That does some simple logic, um, prepending the environment to a given list. And um, now what's interesting is that how this builder is implemented. So builder is, well, a nested class in, inside the spore object. And this nested class, you know, of course, it has these three type parameters, and it takes the the body of the spore as a as a parameter here, right? So body again takes environment type and then parameter type and return type. And um, now, what's interesting is that uh, when we call the constructor, not only are we passing body, but there's also a context parameter, right, for which the compiler is going to infer an instance, right? So the compiler is going to synthesize a, a read writer for type E, where E is the environment type, OK? So we will look up at compile time, you know, a matching read writer for E. And this is uh, done when we, you know, invoke the, the, the constructor. And this is amazing because later on, when this builder is used, uh, for instance, to you know, construct a spore, well, uh, it's actually possible to go from a serialized environment, as shown here. It's an optional string, right? So it's a serialized version of the environment. It's an option because some spores don't have an environment, OK? But it's essentially a serialized environment. And we, we are still able to construct a proper spore in memory um, because we have a deserializer for type E, right, that's already part of the um part of the instance here and we can use that uh you know when we call read uh, down here because this read meth method will use the read writer uh for type e okay so um so this is uh, very good right so as soon as long as we have uh as long as the constructor has been invoked we have already the serializer and deserializer and so all the methods uh, later on they can uh, they can make use of that Okay, and uh, yeah, just to finish this part, of course, when we create this serializable form of a spore, which is called spore data, uh, we also need to do some checks. So for instance, um, spore data, the apply method of spore data actually checks that the argument is a top level object so that it has, uh, you know, it can be, uh, accessed from the top level and uh, it also statically you know uh, looks up the fully qualified name uh, because the fully qualified name can then be used when we when we actually serialize the spore data right so spore data has a very clear serialization uh, namely you know the fully qualified name of the builder and the uh, environment okay yeah so Spores 3, um, what's the implementation status? Uh, well, there is an open source implementation uh, with a uh, pre-release, right? So you're uh, invited to, to give it a try, right? Try the pre-release um, uh, version 010, OK? And uh, yeah, so you have everything on GitHub. And uh, right now, it supports. JVM and Scala JS, uh, but support for Scala native is planned for the near future. Uh, there are no uh, 
obstacles that we foresee so it should not be um uh, a big a big issue um there's some out of the box integration with micropickle um and integrations with other frameworks are, are planned okay so just to summarize um uh, if you use closures in a distributed or concurrent setting you know there are some safety risks that you should uh, think about uh, i showed you some examples right and uh, some advice on how you should think about to to avoid uh safety issues and uh and then i've given an overview of uh, a new library for scala 3 called spores 3 which uh yeah uh tries to make working with closers uh safer and also more flexible right so it's a new implementation of the the idea behind uh spores and uh spores essentially yeah what they do is they make the environment explicit and also track track its type using uh, type refinements right and uh that allows expressing type-based constraints right so we can express, uh, for instance, serializability or uh, uh, threat safety. You know, um, you know, assuming we have suitable type classes for that. And um, yeah, then I've showed you an approach to serialization, which is uh, kind of new in Spores three, and uh, it's based on type classes. So it's quite flexible. Um, the safety is determined statically, and uh, it supports uh, portable serialization as well. Yeah, with this, uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. Thanks so much for that great talk, Philip. Let's jump into questions. We've got a few for you. So let's start with the first one. Portability, are there any hard requirements for a platform or can Spore 3 be usable on Scala Native as well, published for Scala 3.2? Um, yeah, so so I think that um, it's, uh, so Scala Native support is not shipped yet, uh, but um, like I said, there should not be any major obstacle, right? So um, the main thing that's required is to use, um, because Spores 3, they, it needs uh, kind of very minimal support for reflection, but the support for reflection that it requires actually exists on all of Scala's platforms, right? So it does exist, uh, of course, for JVM, but also for JS and for Scala native as well. In fact, there's a library uh, called, I think, Portable, portable reflection, uh, right? And um, so this uh, is actually what um, uh, can be used for, for spores. Um, so yeah, it should not be an issue. It's just not yet part of the implementation, right? So right now there is, again, JVM support and Scala JS support, but um, Scala native should come very soon. And then, and then uh, all you need for portable serialization also on native uh, is, you know, if your library your serialization library supports it like uh if micropickle supports scala native for instance then you could also use that right or any other portable serialization library essentially fantastic all right next question is there a tool that can detect cases which can be rewritten using spore 3 in the existing code base and to recommend how to rewrite it ah good question uh, well, that would be nice, um, but I'm not aware of uh, any tool that can do that. Um, it could be fun to uh, investigate maybe some Scala fix uh, code or something, or some analysis, right, that can sort of analyze your code and check, okay, maybe here's a place where there might be a safety issue, perhaps because you're using futures or, you know, could even, or some other library right and then kind of uh yeah so maybe perhaps suggest a rewrite um i think it would be very interesting does not exist right now as far as i'm aware but uh yeah would definitely be a, a cool project mm -hmm. excellent 
All right, next question. Can Spores 3 detect at compile time bound identifiers in the Spore Builder body that are not part of the ENV? Um, uh, yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, um, that's actually also part of the macro based checking, right? So, mm -hmm. builders uh, are also checked for uh things captured that are not in the in the explicitly provided environment yeah gotcha all right our next question does the capture checking or the thread save type class reject mutable variables does it use macros to determine whether they are vars all ah, right uh, good question um well so if you um if you capture anything uh, maybe I can show an exa the example. Uh, so let's say capture some. Oh no, sorry. Let's go to the overview. Sorry about that. So let's say we have a spore with an environment, uh, but this applies to spores without environment uh, in the same way. If you would refer to a var, to a var that's outside of the spore, okay then the macro would uh, detect that and flag it as illegal okay so you cannot uh, you cannot refer to a var um, outside it, you can never do that okay so the only thing you could do to break things is to pass something explicitly uh, which might be uh, not threat safe let's say right but like i showed you uh, you can you can prevent this uh, in using this uh, uh, pattern, right? You can basically demand that there's a threat safe type class um, for the environment, and that uh, if you if you would not have an instance of that threat safe type class, the code would not compile, right? So yeah, but it assumes again that you have the definition of uh, instances of the threat safe type class. That's not provided by Spores three, by the way, because I mean, here, this could be any type class that you are interested in, right? Um, so that's why Spores 3 does not, you know, give you some specific ones. If that makes sense. Great. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Let's do one more. Why does the builder need to be top level? Isn't it enough that it is stable, that is object and object? Uh, yes, uh, so it's so a good question, and actually it's correct what you say, uh, um, and I, I oversimplified things a little bit. Uh, it could actually be a, um, a, an object nested in another object, for instance, okay? So it's actually the path that, like, the, the, the builder needs to be, you know, reachable from the root uh, with a, you know, publicly accessible path, okay? That's actually enough. So the, the macro that checks that is actually more flexible than just saying top level object okay so i i kind of oversimplified uh, at this point so yes you can have you know uh path uh, uh instead of just top level object great thank you for explaining that thank you for taking time to answer questions and again philip thank you so much for a wonderful presentation thank you for joining us here at ScalaCon, and i hope you enjoy the rest of the conference thanks a lot yeah thanks firing retro rock roger matt Thank you.